I, I was just about to ask you, I mean, Margaret made a beautiful comment here, conscious dying, right? That's something that, um, I mean, definitely COVID brought to our attention. We are now um, being more and more aware of the mortality rate and are hearing these stories all the time. So we become conscious of our own dying, of our own life um, as well. And when we are talking about um, the wills, that's something that is actually like a post-mortem contract. So I want to... Um, make sure that whatever my belongings are, are going into the hands of those people that I trust perhaps, or mm. you know, whatever my property is, I want to make sure that this is what happens. This is pretty much what I perceive as the will. However, um, how, under what circumstances I die, that is a separate question. And to me, mm. that's a question of dignity, whether I'm provided with a free will when it comes to in what time or under what circumstances I'm willing to die and under what circumstances I'm actually forced to die. Because to me, um, having a prohibition of euthana euthanasia, I mean, that's actually my question to you. What is your opinion of euthanasia? Is it, like, I understand why countries are prohibiting it, but is that changing as well? And how do you see um, that change happening or what's your positioning on euthanasia? Yeah, so, well, that's something that's close to my heart. And even at university, I had, you know, for my, in my degree, that was my topic for my sort of final year um, project was the right to dignity and the right to choose whether to die and how you will die. Um, and so I am very pro-euthanasia. Um, I think we are, we, we, we are autonomous beings um, and it is something that we, should have a choice about and I yeah I think you know being so being put on some people don't want to live at all costs um, and we're also seeing that uh, we don't know much yet but we'll this will come in the future that COVID those who survive survive with some harm uh, to their lungs and potentially to other areas of their body um, and you know so when you reach a certain age you might not want to have everything done to save your life because you feel you've had a good life and also every ventilator that's used for someone could be used for somebody else so um and i think we're going to see people refusing treatment far more which is something that we we hear about but we don't see often but now there will be more of that i think and that people are taking control over what they want done to their bodies um and i think for me it is around the right to dignity you know that you, you to be forced to um to carry on living merely because society says that we value life over death yes. when you don't want to personally just that, you know, seems to be um, not really recognizing our autonomy as individuals um, and also puts people in such undignified um, situations. I heard recently um, somebody who, who wanted to die and um, could not, uh, in the UK, I think, so what could not afford euthanasia and so in the end, she put a plastic bag over her head um, to kill herself. And I mean, there's no dignity in that, you know, to be forced into that when you could just have a, a planned death with the people you love and care around you. Yeah, I think, I think what you're seeing right now, Rhiannon, is so profound on several levels. Um, and... Uh, um, a couple of years ago, I had my first like really serious um, brush or, or experience with death with a very close family member. And uh, I, 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 so what I'm... A lot of yeah. um, fear. It's not just around who will get my house. Um, people are, are seeing this as an opportunity to to be caring and in case something happens to them and to look after those that are left behind. So, yeah. 
Makes sense. Sorry, Margaret. My so, connection is horrible. My connection is horrible. So let's just forget <laughs> me in this conversation. Uh, but no, I just, I, if I do get a good connection right now, I just want to see what you're saying is so profound because I think that what we do is we, as a society, we have somewhere along the way, we have really, I would say, othered death. We have cut ourselves off from the reality of death. We make it something that until it, it's enough, we can't ignore it. We make it something so far off that we don't think about, we avoid it, there's a disconnection. And with that disconnection comes decisions that are not integral. They're not oh. uh, holistic. We make decisions about life in, in a way that does not serve the fullness of who we are as human beings. And so that's why I think your work is so important, not only on an individual level um, with people becoming more conscious of death being part of who they are and a part of their experience and taking autonomy over that shift, which is so beautiful. But listening to you, I'm wondering how, you know, your work, your philosophy, your perspective, and, and, and the principles you apply in nurturing, or I know there's something called a doula, you know, a death doula, mm -hmm. kind of like helping people through that process, how we could transpose that to a macro level. Um, because if we have mm -hmm. policy makers uh, that are, it's all about, oh my God, we don't want people to, to and it's fair and all this sort of thing. Wait, hang on, let me just try to elaborate this point that is coming to me. You know, there was a lot that was said about the herd immunity approach. That, mm. oh my God, this is so uncaring and unfeeling to let the older people, you know, to consider, well, we'll do what we can to help. But if this is happening, we, we can't shut down the country and I'm not advocating for or against, okay? I'm, I'm hearing all the negatives coming at me. But however, I'm saying um, there, there is something to be said, I think, for us recognizing, as you are saying, that death is a natural part of life, is a natural part of society. And so, mm, I mean, you know, how do we transpose some of those principles to the macro level uh, to inform policy making and, and, and decision making around COVID? Should our policy making be driven by fear and the desire to hold on to life at all costs? Or should our policy making be driven by wanting to ensure the best quality of life um, that people have while navigating this this thing that we don't know. How do we find that tension between these two? So I, I, it's fascinating what you said because I think it, it can help us.